Welcome to Working Lunch, the home for sensible money news. Time for tea. Emma Bridgewater's been running her teapot and crockery business for a quarter of a century. She'll tell us how her secret brew for business success has worked for her. I'm sure that Emma will agree with me on that as well. You know a thing or two about tea and posh tea. Is, is it Devon cream tea all it's cracked up to be? Oh, well, I think I'm all for cream teas. Cream teas for all. Um, and if they want to <laughs> make them, um, designate them as Devon special, that's absolutely fine. This will be Set your some standards. This would be your policy in any coalition government document. <laughs> then. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you this while you're here. How do you stop a, tea tr a teapot from dribbling? Well, it's quite difficult. Your very best bet is a silver teapot. But we really? take great care with ours as well. Oh, we it's see. all in the finish of the spout. Yes. You mean silver as in proper silver, not one that just looks metallic? Yes, because a sharp edge. Okay. Sort of acts like a blade. The other Cuts option, of course, things. is to test them in the shop before you buy them, but many people sort of shy away from that. And we encourage it. In Ab your shops? Yes, absolutely. OK, there's lots more that we'll talk to you about on this. Well, it's time to read the tea leaves with our guest of the day. Emma Bridgewater's company's been making fancy teapots for the last 25 years. It's based in the historic home of the English pottery business in Stoke-on-Trent. Well, 180 people work there, making every piece of pottery by hand. Well, they craft around 5,000 pieces of pottery every day. Impressive amount. Emma, do come over and join us. And what we're seeing in our walls behind you are some of the some of the patterns, some of the designs that you've come up with. We'll talk about uh, how you protect those in a moment. Uh, what's striking is reading the uh, sort of information about you is that you were coming up with designs like this with uh, bits of sponge and with coloured paints at the at the kitchen table as a teenager. Um, early twenties. Early twenties. And I have to credit my husband, who is um, a very good designer. I'm a I'm an amateur and an enthusiast, but he's a pro. So quite a lot of these, the lovely birds and the flowers are drawn by him. But this is a business that really, literally can trace itself back to the kitchen table. Absolutely. That's what where it started. What, what gave you the idea that this would sell, that people would pay money for this? Um, I had one of those wonderful ka moments when I was looking for a birthday present for my mum. And I stood in a china shop, old-fashioned china shop, the sort there used to be lots of, and thought, but this is mad. They're not... Nobody's making the stuff that people really surely would want to buy. Stuff that would look nice on a dresser, on the kitchen table, in and out of the dishwasher, relaxed. Um, my mum's kitchen was a lovely place where everybody wanted to be cosy, chatty, um, you know, sort of non-stop um, procession of meals. And um, nothing matched on her dresser. No, you know, no two plates the same. And it was sort of that feeling that I thought, that's what we need. But you need it, how do you get the business going? Because that must have been quite an effort. Well, I think it just, it's, it's very odd looking back. It all sort of came together in a rush, in that I talked, I didn't go to art school, I went to university, so I had a sort of build up of creative ideas. I knew what I wanted it to look like, I could picture it completely. I sketched some shapes, I talked to a graphic designer friend, and he said, You need to go to Stoke on Trent. And here's the telephone number of a model maker who will make your drawings into mugs, jugs, bowls. And off I went. And the, for me, the big defining moment was getting off the train at Stoke-on-Trent and discovering this incredible world of very traditional making. But it was an area that used to be thriving in pottery making and it's dwindled. It, there's ba barely any of the originals left there now. It's a dying art there, surely. I hope it's not dying. Um, it certainly had a pretty bad thrashing recently. Um, too many people have pulled out in favour of, you know, seeking for cheap, cheap labour abroad. And why don't abroad. you? Why don't you pull out? Because it would be cheaper to manufacture abroad. Because Surely Stoke's you could fantastic. Get you've, you've got, um, I think they're missing it completely. Uh, the idea of, of abandoning the skills and the, at the working attitudes there is completely mad. Is this an important part of the branding, of the, the positioning of the product, that it is still made in Britain? For me, it's absolutely crucial, yes. I mean, it's it, it's, it's non-negotiable so As far. important as the design, as important as the look? Well, it, it's an organic process. The, des it, the, pot the pottery looks as it looks because it's made in Stoke. I don't think I could replicate it abroad. But, um, but I wouldn't want to. Many people, I mean, just looking at the writing, we can see in the wall as well, we've seen this impersonated, for want of a better word, copied 
in supermarkets, in all sorts of stores, anywhere on the high street, you see imitations of mm. your work. And so, naturally, people will think, well, I can get something similar to what I like for less, much less of the price. How do you protect your brand? How do you protect your imagery? It's a good question, and it is a real problem for um, creative businesses. I kind of take, I've got two lines on it. One, I sort of think it's a pretty good endorsement. I think it means we're ticking the boxes. We're doing designs that people want. So I take encouragement from that. I make sure that we do get pretty snarly with people who, you know, who cross the line, but... Snarly? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> what a little bit entail? cross. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nice. Um, and then myself, I try not to get too bogged down in it because I think you can really lose the plot. And we've always got lots of new ideas and I'm always kind of looking ahead. So you're taking it as a form of flattery that you see this type of thing that we see on the screen now quite so, uh, so widely? I think it's the only sensible thing to do, really. Otherwise, I'd, um, no, we, we, you know, we tackle it if people are, are really taking the mickey. Mm. I'm struck, uh, again, with the, the, the history of the business that you, you sold a lot through trade fairs to sort of places like Harvey Nichols and Conran, and then you set up your first shop, and that just happened to be in 1990 when the recession was really building up uh, ahead of steam. What would your advice be to anyone thinking about setting up a business now, but who's worried about the state of the economy today? Keep your costs tightly under control. It's a great discipline. It's just winter. It, it has to happen. We've traded through several recessions. Um, it, I think, you know, you know that if you can cope with that, then when the good times come, which, you know, a bit of luck, they will, you're ready, get ready. I think. Are you worried, have you been worried during a session that people won't be willing to spend, say, £60 for a teapot? There's a lot of money. Of course we think about that, yes. Have you and had to change your pricing or your... No, no, we... Um, I, think, I think there is a growing understanding. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about food miles. Well, um, what about plate miles? You know, and, and something that is homemade and you know, made with love and care and attention, I think, I think people do understand that this is an heirloom, that they probably will, you know, barring accidents, pass to their children, and that seems to kind of, it seems to work. Okay, Emma, good to speak with you. Thanks Thank very you. much.